Stagger and start by the loose. He's thrown five outs on nine pitches. All of them strikes. Stepping in for the conventional white stop suit. Lead off hit. One out away from a stunning two-hit shutout for the loose. Home run for Fred Davis. Jimmy. I was in the minor leagues a long time ago, and uh, it's bus rides, it is bad lighting in ballparks, it is what people don't realize, six, seven, eight months of playing baseball without a day off, or maybe with one or two days off only. It was great. That's the answer. Um, it, you, professional ball players playing for a few hundred dollars a month. And um, what you're worried about are not the things that people, the fan, thinks you're worried about. When you make your living as a professional athlete, you're worried about uh, keeping your job and you're looking for girls. That's basically it. The thing I miss most about uh, not playing now, I think, is just coming to the ballpark every day. I get questions all the time, uh, not as much as I used to, but uh, about don't you miss it? And uh, sure, there's things about it that I miss. I miss coming to the ballpark and seeing the excitement. And uh, they asked me, do I regret uh, being out of baseball? And I don't, you know. I've, I'm in another stage in my life and I'm enjoying other things. The only part that I, I truly miss is being that competitor in between the lines. Uh, if, if you're doing this all your life, you know, obviously you want to compete. Uh, you love the game. And that's probably the, the, the one thing that I miss is just being out there competing. Um, but you know, you're, you're finished, you're across the lines now, and you know, you just have to help those kids move along. He can go all the way. Mm -hmm. Where can I go? You can keep going to the ballpark, keep getting paid to do it. I was at that time the president of Universal Studios, and we were I was looking around personally for a picture that would make some sense in terms of minor league baseball. Uh, growing up in a small town in the south, I grew up in Durham, North Carolina. Uh, the pleasures of a Sunday or Saturday evening in a ballpark with a hot dog and, you know, 100 degrees heat and 100 percent humidity and uh, a lot of ball players, many young ones on the way up and old ones on the way down and that kind of astonishing collision of will and ambition and potential glory. I thought it was romantic and I thought it was great. And the more I got to know Ron, and the more I was convinced that this guy had a huge contribution to make in terms of storytelling. Mostly I thought that nobody ever got sports movies right, that they were always told from the point of view of the fan. And I don't think the fan has any idea what sports is about. That's perfectly all right that they don't know what sports is about, and it's a good thing they don't know. But I wanted to write a movie that got into the dugout and into the buses and into the shower and went out to the mound to hear what they actually talked about and shared my feeling that these are a bunch of working class guys trying to make a living and, and uh, keep the dream alive and not, not get the pink slipped and sent home. So it came out of a very simple desire to, to do a sports movie the right way. It's not a movie that depends on the last home run. Or, or last win, which is which is kind of unique in sports film, where traditionally it's the 15th round, it's the a Rocky kind of theme. This is this is there's a lot more at stake here than winning a championship. We're talking about people coming of age, of understanding what love is, and and uh, leaving one life behind them and moving on to another. Ron called one day and said, "I figured it out." I said, "What is that?" We're going to put in the center of this baseball picture a story about sexual withholding, a story about sexual politics as run from a woman's perspective. And that will inform the central core of the story and change this from a movie about baseball to, of course, a movie about love, which is all anybody really cares about at the end of the day. Every studio turned this script down twice. Um, and the second time I went around with Kevin Coster at my side and Kevin was saying, this guy's the director, He's, he can do it, he's great, blah, 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 we, still nobody would do it. Well, Ron came to me and uh, we had a meeting of a minds and, um, and, and so we were kind of joined at the hip and we wanted to make this movie and it was, it was a struggle because uh, baseball was not seen as a commercial avenue for movies and it was seen as too expensive. The, the movie was sitting around six and a half million dollars, seven million dollars and it was just deemed too expensive 
to make and all that in retrospect seems kind of ludicrous. Susan was great because here I was as a first time director and she had been in, in many movies and uh, she kind of showed up on the set every day the way Annie Savoy showed up to the ballpark. Kind of, hiya fellas, how's it going, you know? Let the boys be boys, but uh, mama's here and your girlfriend and your dreams and they're all in one body and in one mind and one heart and soul. Well, you can't think about the movie without thinking of Sue you know, um, about how she is in the movie. And you know, she's very trusting. And, and uh, you know, there's a scene in a batting cage where we talk and a ball is whizzing between us, just whizzing between us. And um, uh, I wanted it to do it that way. And, and, and she just understood it perfectly. Got the script and it was a fabulous script. It was so funny and the part was great. And it was, you know, just busted every kind of cliche and of course they were not interested in me they had uh, I was not even at the bottom of a list I wasn't even on the list but for some reason they either couldn't find somebody that could both talk and do some of the sexual stuff there was a very short list of people that they felt worthy to have this part and um, they wouldn't read so suddenly you know there was a tiny little window of opportunity for me to um, humiliate myself so I flew myself on my own dime from Italy where I was living and I came in and I borrowed a dress and I went in and I read the entire script and kind of groveled and on my way out to a number of studio executives and then went back to Italy eventually a neighbor came and got me just a few days after we've been back and, and it turned out that I had had gotten it Tim was really the unknown at that time and I had to fight hard for Tim, and I love Tim, and I think he's great, because Tim's a very serious guy, as you know, and Tim has a great, goofy sense of humor, so my job was just to get him to trust that goofy sense of humor and to play Nuke Lelouch with utmost seriousness and conviction, uh, and not try to get a laugh, play him straight. And, uh, you know, I don't know if Tim's ever been this funny or compelling, really. It's hard to get someone to play an asshole as well as Tim does. I mean, he really has the market cornered on that. And you have to be pretty smart to be able to pull that off. And he, he didn't get into Kevin's territory, and those guys didn't get into my territory. And everybody, you know, is very Darwinian. We all specialized in what our little niche was. And that's what I think really contributed to the balance of the movie. I hadn't read it when I, um, I auditioned for it for the first time. And then when I met Ron, I'd read this thing. And um, it was just so great, you know, so funny and so um, human and romantic. And talking about this sport I've loved the best since I was a child. Robert Wool came in and gave the worst audition in the history of motion pictures. He has very high metabolism. Robert is going 1,000 miles an hour all the time. And he came in for like a five minute audition and just had nuclear energy and was up and down the walls and he left the office and the casting director said geez I'm sorry he really was way over the top that wasn't a very good audition I said that may be the worst audition I've ever seen hire him I think he's great Robert genuinely had an understanding of athletics and and uh, and his his role wasn't completely flushed out and so every time the camera was turned on him you could count on him to stay in the moment with with the ball game he's a very inventive guy and it, and it ultimately helped the movie a great deal i mean he's so good that you wish you could do more with him but that would have distorted the movie so every time the camera's on robert he succeeds wasn't sure what to do with this and so i called uh someone i do respect in acting uh bruno kirby and i explained to him the uh the character uh, of the pitching coach and Bruno put it in very good terms in that he said, uh, well, it looks like the pitching coach is with the manager. If the manager, you know, grows in the organization, that he's gonna take the pitching coach with him. So I said, I'm a yes man. I said, okay, I'm a yes man. That's all I need to know. And so uh, the next day I go into the audition. Now, I just start, you know, you know, just, I'm the yes man. Whatever he said, I was gonna parrot. Whatever he said, I was gonna parrot, whether it was in the script or not. So if he said something, I would say, that's right, uh-huh. You know, just, I'm the yes man. I just did it that way. And Ron will tell you, it's the worst audition he ever saw. But I would say, no, I got the job. <laughs> so it worked. Get Millie or Jimmy for their wedding present. Is that about right? That's right. We're yeah. dealing with a lot of shit. I think we'll uh, kick 
candlesticks always make a nice gift, and uh, maybe you can find out where she's registered, maybe a place setting or maybe a silverware pattern. Okay, let's get to it. Let's go. Miles Wolf was the principal owner of the Durham Bulls during this period, and he had been an owner with great vision in seeing the potential of minor league baseball at a time that people were ignoring the minor leagues, and he had single-handedly turned the Durham franchise around from a place that couldn't find an owner to a place that was selling out all the time, and uh, he was very, very helpful to us in, in making the facility available and... Um, uh, all manner of things. I mean, uniforms and, you know, everything. Minor League Baseball still provides something that Big League Baseball doesn't. It's more immediate, it's closer, the price is right. And there's a kind of an interaction between town and team that happens in the minors that doesn't happen anywhere else. And Miles was, Miles was all over that. In 1979, I went to the league and they granted me a franchise for about $2,500, which was cheap then and cheaper now, but 2500 was about all the money I had at that stage, and so I started hustling stock to friends, relatives, anybody I knew, and I knew a guy on the West Coast, Van Schley, and I hit Van for some money. I said, do you know anybody else? And he said, I know this guy that works for Universal, Tom Mount. He's originally from Durham, North Carolina. Give him a call. And Tom said, yeah, he'd invest, and he came to Durham that fall and sort of walked around the ballpark and said to them, someday I'll make a movie here. And we said, sure, Tom, you know, anytime you want to. We thought it was just Hollywood talking. It was a dream of mine that I'd be able to go back to my hometown and make a movie about minor league ball. Truthfully, I was confident that the Durham Bulls would emerge as the center of the story. And I was confident because, you know, the Durham Athletic Park was this remarkable, run-down, old WPA-era extravaganza, poured concrete and rust, because Ron is a guy who wears his heart on his sleeve. And I thought, you know, at the end of the day, romance will win this war. And it did. We were in that lovely little stadium the whole time. I mean, we were there. We had, all had local houses. I love the location. It really is a, a great kind of boost for your imagination. And the South is fabulous. You know, you couldn't get away with saying the stuff that Annie says without a Southern accent. There's just no way you could do it. And that whole tradition of those kind of women and that kind of storytelling, you know, because the women really are in charge in the South. I don't know if you've figured this out yet, but all those Southern bells, they're ruling down there with an iron hand and so it's pretty fun to to watch how that all operates they're proud of their community uh, they got a lot to be proud of and we were coming down there and we were kind of highlighting it in, in a certain way and um, i find that communities for the most part that aren't completely uh, assaulted by movie productions day in and day out are, are always a really open and giving and i just i really like being there and and that we didn't try to make it a cute stadium or any, you know, thing other than it was. It was a minor league ballpark with, with, you know, big league drama. I've shot a lot of movies in the South. I like the South. Half of my family is from the South originally and uh, I have a home in New Orleans, so I feel connected south of Mason-Dixon line in many ways. The um, problem was we were shooting in November and it was about 34 degrees and we had to keep painting the grass green because it kept turning brown. There's one scene where Jenny Robertson has the radar gun and she's timing Nuke Lelouch and she can't open her mouth without this very heavy, frosty breath coming out. They made us put ice in our mouths for scenes so that when we talked, there wouldn't be, you know, your warm breath coming out. That was really like torture. Nothing would work. And it was about a minute and a half take and finally I just said, don't breathe. This was her first movie and her first day. I figured I could tell her anything. so. She, she went and did the whole take without breathing, and it solved the problem. If you look closely during the filming, you'll see uh, the leaves in the background are changing. Real observant folks will see the sky looks more like a fall sky. And, and in the scene, the fantasy or dream scene where, where Nuke is pitching in his garter belt, if you look closely, you'll see uh, Tim's breath because it was quite cold that night, and Tim was quite the tough guy to, uh, to go through that whole scene standing out there in his underwear with, uh, you know, when it was 33 degrees. I think that the oil was not actually 
a, a choice, a, an aesthetic choice, but a necessity, you know? And I, I don't remember how we came to that decision to put the oil all over the body, whether it was like, hey, that'll look sexy, or if you don't do it, he's gonna freeze to death. I remember the pitching motion with a jock strap and a garter belt on, how the, it had altered from when you're in your in your uh, uniform. But garter belt and jock strap and your ass showing, and how, I, all I could think of as I was doing it is keep the form, keep the pitching form. It's got, it, you can't let this distract you. You must, must pitch correctly. <laughs> the grass was brown. The trees were changing. The leaves were gone. We're trying to shoot a baseball movie in the summer, and it's like fall going to winter. We've got guys running around with vegetable dye, spraying grass on the thing, trying anything we could do to find a shot that looked halfway like it was warm. That's one of the reasons, by the way, that several of the scenes were converted to night scenes. Because, of course, you know, the darker it is, the less I have to show you the trees. I've cast the professional athletes in a lot of my movies, golf, basketball. You know, a lot of the guys in uh, White Men Can't Jump were ex-pros or college stars, and obviously Bull Durham. And I would rather work with, with uh, nobody on this planet more than athletes because, first of all, an athlete is already completely um, disciplined. You can say, go stand over there for eight hours and entertain yourself. They will. They're used to taking orders. They're used to having a coach. They're used to having X's and O's. Run over there, do that. Run over there, do that again. Then go to the locker room and come back in 20 minutes. So, I mean, athletes are like dealing with the military in that regard. They'll do whatever you tell them as, as long and as many times as you tell them, and they don't complain. They don't have trailers. They don't complain. So I love, I love the athletes. Plus, they're good-spirited, and they're funny, and... Uh, you never have to worry about getting keeping an athlete up. They're in the ballpark, they're fine. That was a comfortable experience for me. I didn't feel really out of my league there at, at, at all. Um, I didn't pretend that I was one of them, but I didn't feel out of my league. Sports prolongs adolescence. It, it uh, these guys that get in it and are in their early 20s, and then in their mid 20s, and then in their late 20s, are really prolonging this inevitable. Crash had to personify being tired of that and wanting to move on and, and reading a book and, uh, you know, okay, the kids are gonna push each other around and snap each other with towel. I'm a little tired of that, you know. I've got a different vision of life and of baseball. I had all those guys over to my house for chicken almost every single night, the entire team. I was making barbecue and Thanksgiving. We had everybody there. It was a fun set, I have to admit. It was really fun. But that was very much the atmosphere. I mean, first of all, he got everybody playing baseball together um, so that they really could play. Um, the actors and the uh, real baseball guys, you know, spend a lot of time together. I was in the batting cage a lot. We, we kind of just, yeah, everybody was very generous with each other. Well, I always talk to you about looking at it as a ball, as a ball club, the team. And different ball players give you different things. Some guys, you know, are big sluggers. Other guys are pesky little hitters. Other guys bring other things to the party. And with Trey and I, um, he realized he had a comedy team. He had Abbott and Costello. He had Laurel and Hardy. You know, so he had these two guys who were the comedy team. And we played it as such. And Ron recognized it was working. It was a good double play combination up the middle. Well, there was great chemistry on the set, but I think there's always great chemistry on my sets. I sort of don't allow it. I think that's something that the director can set the tone for, almost uh, in a way that you want to look effortless, but is slightly benignly dictatorial. In other words, if there's any whining or complaining, get off, get out of here. Um, I don't think I've ever had a set in which people didn't get along. That is my model. As, as, as it being a ball club you're putting together. In other words, let me put 25 guys on the field who will work hard together. Ron, of course, had been a ball player. He knows what baseball really is and what it looks like. So we took Kevin out to a batting cage. We got a batting instructor and just started hitting balls until he began to look and feel like someone who really was a ball player. Nobody can resist walking on a set without picking up a bat and 
kind of reliving a dream. You see the women do it, and you see the the guys do it, and kind of think back to that sixth grade home run that you you know you had. Kevin called to say, "Look, you played baseball professionally. I didn't." He says, "I want to make sure I pass your tests." So before, in effect, he let me approve him. We went out to Van Nuys Boulevard batting cage, where there's like three miniature golf courses and uh, a big batting cage, and. Uh, uh, this was in an afternoon. I'll never forget. We went from the old studio grill, had a couple of drinks, went out to Van Nuys. We had a couple of old taped-up baseballs, a couple of gloves. We went in the batting cage and took batting practice. And, and uh, he had a beautiful swing. And then we went out into it, and nobody, you know, people were walking right by him. We put our quarters in there like everybody else. And afterward, I said, Kevin, you've got a gorgeous swing. You, I mean, you, you, he is a baseball player. He is a real athlete. Kevin is one of the only actors who can actually do the sport. They all think they can, but there's only about three that can, and Kevin is one. I was somewhat critical when I looked at it to start with because I knew what minor league life was like, and I wanted to see that the movie uh, truly depicted that. And it was, it was very accurate in some areas. Uh, you know, you certainly had the long bus rides, and it sort of depicted when you were losing and you weren't uh, winning, that it was tough and not a lot of fun, and that was true, but when you were winning, uh, it was great. There was nothing better. When I first saw the movie, everyone, you know, a lot of my friends go, is that how it is in the minor leagues? And I tell you, close. There are Crash Davises, um, plenty of Crash Davises. The bus trips back in the day, they, they were similar to that. The clubhouse scenes, with Nuke and uh, Millie, that doesn't happen. It was unbelievable. The movie was close. The movie certainly turned the Bulls into a national icon, got endless press. All that being said, for me, I preferred the old Bulls. I expected it to be received really well. You never know how a film is going to do, you know, money-wise. But I expected those people that saw it could understand it, could get the feeling from it, would feel really satisfied. The reward to me about this movie is that we're sitting here 12 years later talking about it, and that um, that it has become that certain sort of archetypes have entered the film and, and, you know, in American mythological kind of arena of the Crash Davises and the New Galushas and the Annie Savoys and that, and that this part of sports was rediscovered, the part that is still pure and not sullied by big money and agents and television. It's a very good piece of writing. It's a very good piece of directing. It's the right people in the right parts. You know, it, it, it works. It's a good story. It's a story about people with passion, passion for what they do, passion for life, uh, passion for each other, you know, reaching goals, um, trying to make it to a place that, you know, is the unreachable star, you know, and giving up hope, but meeting somebody along the way who gives you more hope. It's got very little. It's, it's, baseball is, is irrelevant. You end up minimizing how great of experience it is because you don't want to seem like you're gloating over everything, but it was really a... It was a real highlight for all of us in our careers to be making that movie together. For me, it was finally a great role in a great project and a, a, with really great actors to work off of. Um, I was uh, down there in North Carolina just saying, wow, this is a good life. I am so lucky because, you know, to be there, not only doing a good script with a great script with great actors, but to be playing baseball in between takes, oh my God, you know? To be playing a baseball player, something I dreamed of being all my childhood, you know? It was like magical. It was so, I just happened into it and it was so fun and, and you know, it was the easiest, smoothest job I've, I've ever had. And the funnest. I mean, it was really the funnest. Well, Durham's closest to my heart. It also just was, for me, a huge turning point. Not, I mean, yeah, I met Tim and we got together after the movie and all of that changed my life, but really, um, I was drifting more and more into trying to find some kind of something real and of worth. It, it restored a lot of my um, faith in myself and in the process of what making that family 
that team that you are asked to make when you do a film really what that's about, you know. And um, and so that was a. I really had to look at my life and make a decision at that point about just where the showbiz uh, was going to be in terms of my life at that point because Annie Savoy demanded it in a way. But I will say that Bull Durham opened up doors for me that were never opened up to me before, allowed me the possibility of actually getting offered things without having to audition for them and started really the um, possibility and the feasibility of me having a long career in, in, in films. But it also began a, uh, uh, another realm and another phase of my life and it uh, brought me two amazing boys and one amazing stepdaughter. And for that, Bull Durham is the film when people ask me what is the most important film you've ever done or what is your favorite film. I always have to say that because it's really did truly alter uh, the direction of my life. I always look back at Bull Durham as a highlight for myself. I, I've enjoyed my career. I've enjoyed the movies I've been able to be a part of. Um, but it just, uh, you know, it's a, it's a movie that matched up with my own expectations and an audience acceptance and a sensibility that I, that I like to project. What this movie, to me, it, it made it possible for me to direct other movies. This is, this is the beginning of Ron Shelton, the director. And for that, I, uh, I will always be able to smile when I, when I think of it. Uh, the curse of Bull Durham is that people want me to keep making Bull Durham. And I did it. I don't need to anymore. And I will make comic movies and not comic movies and movies about sports and movies not about sports. But um, once you've made a movie that's beloved, it, it is a curse as well as a blessing. What do you believe in then? Well, I believe in the soul. The cock, the pussy, the small of a woman's back, the hanging curveball, high fiber, good scotch, that the novels of Susan Sontag are self-indulgent, overrated crap. I believe Lee Harvey Oswald acted alone. I believe there ought to be a constitutional amendment outlawing AstroTurf and the designated hitter. I believe in the sweet spot, softcore pornography, opening your presents Christmas morning rather than Christmas Eve, and I believe in long, slow, deep, soft, wet kisses that last three days. Good night. Oh, my.